Give it 30 seconds. Do you want to do the okay. interesting? And do the clicking with the topic. <laughs> well, well we, we can swap at any time. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dots. I'm glad you're here to join us. Uh, my name is Roman Tenedu, and I'm co-chairing with Tobias Gondrum. So let's get started. So you've seen this, I'm sure, in previous, uh, previous uh, sessions. The note well, of course, applies to this meeting. We have the blue sheets passed around. Please, please do make sure that you sign it so we can provision the room uh, in future meetings. And wanted to thank our Jabber scribes and our note takers, Frank and Bob, very much appreciated. Agenda-wise, we have uh, a full deck uh, ahead of us. What you see there is not that different than what was on the mailing list. I think only one implementation report was added. Would anyone like to bash this agenda? OK, I take that as no. Let's proceed forward. Before we do that, just wanted to give you a quick status update on where we stand in the working group. Since we got together last in ITF 97, we had a virtual interim in February. We also had a design team meeting earlier this week on Monday. Two working group documents have been updated. And earlier this week, we started a poll for adoption on the data channel document. There's been some traffic on that. Uh, please do respond, and we're, we have some time on the agenda to talk about that later. Uh, there are also a couple of updates in the individual drafts. We're going to get into a lot of these documents during our time here. We have an updated use case, dash 04. Uh, no movement uh, since we last got together in terms of published documents on the IMDM. With regards to the status of the solutions, it's actually hard to see there uh, in the graphic. Uh, but uh, we've, we've had a couple of updates that you see reflected there in green. But in the case of the bottom three documents, the authors on that draft have said for the time being, they're going to pause progress on these drafts and put their energy into those top two drafts. And we can further this conversation uh, when we talk about the, the solutions. We'll talk a little bit more about milestones after we wrap up on the drafts. But I throw this up to point out that we are behind. Uh, we need to revise those milestones to reflect reality, and we need to start really pressing forward with our with our solutions kind of drafts, and we can talk about how to do that specifically, uh, again, after we hear the presentations. So to the agenda, first up for us is Roland, who's going to be talking about our use cases. So we have the clicking now. One moment. Okay. Hi, I'm Rola Evans, Over Networks. Okay. Uh, the clippy is not working. I'm not smart enough to use it. Here we go. Okay, uh, here we go. So, um, first of all, thanks very much to Daniel Mago uh, and uh, Frank Shaw um, who pushed this update out. Um, with the 04 uh, draft of use cases, the structure has been simplified. So, a lot of the stuff that was in the appendices, um, we've been unnecessary uh, and has been dropped. Uh, we've added an orchestration section, um, not because DOTS is vital to the operation um, of orchestrators, but to provide use cases, a use case, at least one use case, that shows um, how a DDoS mitigation orchestration system would interact with external entities um, via DOTS and what effect different DOTS messages you know, would have. Uh, on the, the actions that the orchestration system takes in order to successfully mitigate uh, DDoS attacks. So that's actually a pretty lengthy section uh, that has been added. There's also a new intra-organizational uh, use case. This is actually um, having uh, to do with a broadband access ISP um, who are protecting uh, their customers against DDoS attacks and, and, and how the use of DOTS would take place um, between their customers and their actual um, orchestration system and DDoS mitigation systems. Um, even though 
the end customers themselves are actually, you know, whether they're individuals, they're small home offices, what have you, they're different entities. This is actually considered an intra-organizational use case because the broadband access ISP operate the entire uh, network infrastructure there. It's not as if this is in like an enterprise who operate their own network infrastructure and have their own distinct transit edge where they're purchasing transit from one or more um, multiple providers. So it's a little bit different. That's pretty extent, uh, ex ex extent, ex uh, a pretty extensive section. Um, and the, the pro style um, is a, a bit more accessible um, as well. So that's really uh, 04 in a nutshell. Um, for 05, we have uh, eight or nine proposed additional uh, use cases that we want to put before the group uh, to take a look at. These are dealing with issues like multi-homing in a scenario where all the different um, upstream transit providers um, support dots, um, but they don't speak to one another, or a situation in which they do speak to one another, or a situation in which an endpoint network um, uh, has multiple upstream providers, but only one of them actually um, supports dots and has uh, a DDoS mitigation service capability. We also have um, provider requesting uh, assistance from a provider, so an overflow scenario, an overflow scenario where where a DDoS mitigation service provider uh, is actively mitigating attacks and they're reaching uh, their capacity in terms of transit and mitigation capacity, so they signal to other operators for assistance uh, using DOTS. And then we also have uh, another use case in that group, which is uh, where there's a federation uh, of, uh, of networks who have joined together uh, for mutual DDoS uh, mitigation assistance, and in this particular case, and uh, a hosting and co-location operator are getting pummeled by a lot of uh, traffic coming originating from a broadband access uh, provider network. And so they actually signal the broadband access provider network to um, suppress the outbound DDoS traffic emanating from their network. So those kinds of use cases um, will be in um, 05. There are some grammatical things and stylistic things that we want to uh, improve from, from 04. Uh, and uh, there's the same thing in the orchestration section. It's not really changing uh, the meaning of the content. Um, in any significant way. It's just stylistic more than anything else. Um, we want to continue to harmonize our terminology with the other drafts. We have a few additional terms and acronyms that we need to uh, define as well. And one of our authors has changed affiliation. So we need to uh, update the, the document, the 05, to reflect his new affiliation. So that's all I have. Questions, comments? So Roland, when, when, when might we expect the 05? Um, relatively soon, um, seven of the nine uh, additional use cases are already written. Have to get the additional ones out there and then get them out, you know, for comments before we, we look at incorporating them. So not long. Uh, can can we quantify this with a date? Okay. Um, I expect a date because not long is a uh, relative term. Let, let's say roughly three weeks. Uh, we can we can try to target that, but it's going to be dependent on how much feedback you know we get back from other folks and how quickly we get it. We can we can shoot for that kind of time frame, but not not very long. Okay, uh, can I suggest uh, with working group head um, first? You can actually, if you have already seven, you can post to seven, and second uh, feedback that comes. I actually want to encourage that this feedback is given on the mailing list. No, we'll all be on the list, not so. off channel, yes. uh, and then it will be again helpful if you just make an update and you know don't don't be shy version numbers okay. are cheap we have plenty of them so um thank you okay hi uh, andrew mortensen arbor networks you had the uh, multi-homing uh, use case there with um uh, some dot servers that were not capable or was that where we have a non homing mm -hmm. scenario where they're all dots capable yep. And uh, a multi-homing scenario where there's multiples, but only one of them is DOTS capable. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the operational impact that will have on the organization that is requesting, you know, the things that they need to take into account mm -hmm. um, when they have to under when they're under DDoS attack, and then they end up um, going from I don't know three upstream providers to one, mm -hmm. right? What kinds of things they have to take into account? That's actually a, a big part of DOTS that I think a lot of folks don't realize is that the technology itself is not magic, right? You know, it's, it's simply a, a lingua franca. And in the use cases, we hope to give the flavor of the other out-of-band things that have to be done in order to to, to make DOTS work. Yeah, good, because one of the outstanding issues on the architecture draft is the multi-homing case, so hopefully the use cases. Yes, and, and we also, uh, to our last architecture call, 
um, in, uh, in one of the use cases, it's a broadband access network where there are multiple DOTS clients that are all signaling um, for mitigation systems because it's a very broad-based attack. And we, we, we talked about um, whether or not it should be considered um, in scope for DOTS, you know, the DOTS servers themselves to try to consolidate alerting or whether that should be, um, you know, up to the orchestration system and what have you. So we, that, that particular use case is included. Thanks. Well. So I wanted to ask uh, if there are no additional questions. I don't see anyone coming to the mic. Are there more use cases out there that you don't see documented in any of the existing individual drafts or in the current working group document? Well, maybe we can get a discussion going. I'll go ahead this evening and send out the seven that are already written down, uh, written out now to help facilitate and get people to comment on them. Hopefully we'll stir up some new ones. I'm wondering whether we should uh, probe the room for who has read O4 because that is just recently released. So did who has read O4 yet? Okay, well that's seven, six, a few people, a handful. Um, yeah, potentially it was too short notice before the meeting. So, okay, then I think we need some more review and uh, well, if you can shoot out some parts early, then maybe the reviewers will be more motivated. <laughs> it's always a little bit, um, people would be hesitated to review a draft if they know oh, the next one is coming in a week. Yeah. Okay. okay, cool. Then, yeah, I encourage that. Actually, I think from a chair perspective, in a couple of weeks or months, we need to go to last call. So I think this is the right time to start uh, to do reviews more. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Roland. Uh, next up is a discussion about requirements. Andrew? Uh, it also occurred to me yesterday we discussed um, getting the use cases draft up into the, the .wg GitHub repository so you can track issues there as well. So uh, hopefully we'll have an update on that soon. Um, all right, so this is an update on the DOTS requirements. Uh, largely this is going to cover the issues that we've been going through uh, and our tracking on GitHub. So let's start with the status. Um, we do have a lot of issues, not a lot, but we have the, the uh, known issues on GitHub in the GitHub tra issue tracker. Um, the open issues right now are the blockers to working group last call. So you can actually monitor our progress uh, toward working group last call by, by tracking the open issues. Uh, just because that's the case doesn't mean we're not accepting new issues. If you have concerns about the existing draft, please go ahead, feel free to add issues. Um, you can do this uh, on the GitHub site, or if you don't feel comfortable with that, bring them up on the mailing list and we can make sure that they get tracked on GitHub. Uh, and Pull requests are welcome too. So if you have changes, suggested changes, you don't need to wait. You can go ahead and fork the repository right now, make changes to the markdown, uh, and then set up a pull request, and we can just pull it right in. So we've closed about half of the known issues since the interim meeting. Um, any any uh, feedback that we get on the pull request has been very helpful. Um, there hasn't been a, a whole lot of interaction there, but what we've gotten so far has been very good. Uh, and you should look for an 05 update very shortly, probably this week. Uh, I've got another uh, pull request or two. Um, and uh, we'll continue working toward the working group last call. I'm not going to go into too much detail here on the recently closed issues. You can, you can find them uh, on the issue tracker. And I've also sent out, I think, a couple updates to the working group mailing list on this. But I will touch on a couple of the more significant ones. Um, issue number nine. Uh, pulled in some language from tier signal channel draft about the uh, path MTU where the uh, dots agents themselves are asked to try to discover this, the path MTU and if they can't they fall back to some reasonable defaults. Uh, I think it's 1280 for the default case and uh, if legacy IPv4 networks are a consideration to fall back to 576 really if necessary. Uh, issue 11 covers uh, what sort of security state the dots client can assume on redirection. Um, we currently have some language there that says the DOTS client cannot assume that the uh, security state is going to be the same on the redirection target. 
Uh, but it, it's free to try to do a session resumption using something like UTS session resumption. <clears throat> I think probably of, of the uh, other closed issues, number 12 is the most significant. Um, this is trying to establish the responsibilities of both parties when it comes to mitigation requests and the status feedback you get from the, the server. Um, this goes into some details as well uh, about the, the details that you're gonna, are going to come back. So packets per second dropped on behalf of the client, bytes per second, total, total bytes dropped, total packets dropped. Uh, there's some additional things there, but they're, I think, less, less important. I think one of the major concerns that, that uh, Dave Dolson, who, whose uh, feedback kind of drove a bunch of these issues, had was uh, about some of the indistinct language for things like mitigation termination handling. So we've tried to clarify that and the responsibilities of both parties when mitigation is actually considered to be totally terminated. Um, this has an aspect where to try to prevent route or DNS flapping, the DOTS client is uh, it can make a request to terminate mitigation, but the server has a small window to leave the mitigation running. So if the, the client decides to re-enable mitigation rapidly, uh, the, dots client, the dots server is not uh, announcing routes again rapidly. Uh, I don't know if this is actually a concern for people. It's sort of an informal survey that I've done with some operators. It seems to me this is uh, relatively important, um, but others have also said we can just do uh, route flap dampening. Um, so I, I would be interested in some feedback if uh, anybody has some. Will and Dabbing server networks. So um, yes, I mean, you, you don't in general want to have to be changing your network network state constantly. Um, however, uh, you know, from my perspective, and maybe this is how it's been discussed, I don't know. This is not really something that should be built into DOTS itself necessarily, but it's an implementation, not, you know, some, some kind of timer. And I think we actually talked about that in the zero zero uh, use cases draft. And you know, when we're talking about the very basic case um, where an IDMS requests uh, mitigation and then terminates terminates the mitigation, that there is an optional, you know, there could be an optional timer um, where the the mitigator keeps the mitigation active. So I don't think that that's necessarily something that should be built into DOTS itself, but it is is certainly something that I would uh, believe an implementer would would maybe want to put that knob on there. So one of the considerations here is, uh, I mean, we're trying not to encode financial relationships, right? But one of the considerations here is to try to figure out at what point the DOTS client's responsibility and ownership of the mitigation term is actually over um, while retaining you know, that flexibility that you're talking about so that the DOTS server operators can leave the mitigation for some small period. But at some point, the DOTS client knows that after that timer expires, it's no longer responsible for the mitigation. We can just assume that since it's asked for the mitigation to be terminated, uh, the dot server operators are free to let that continue running. Maybe they've got uh, the, the attack is continuing to impact the dot server operators network, but not the clients. And the dot client wants no uh, further responsibility. Yeah, roll it out as our networks. Um, so in that scenario, um, you know, and we probably don't need to engineer this in the meeting, but you know, the idea is that you have the dot's client and makes a mitigation request. Dot server accepts it. Mitigation is started. Mitigation status messages are exchanged. Um, then the DOS client says, okay, I'm going to issue a, a mitigation termination request, right? And then, you know, my assumption would be that the um, DOT server would, you know, basically say no <laughs> and then say, you know, the mitigation is still running and continue to provide status updates, you know, until it, you know, based on whatever timers are configured, um, it decides that, uh, uh, that it will indeed close the mitigation down. Yeah, I'm... I'm so I, maybe, I, right? maybe this could be a configuration thing. I think I, I want to make sure that the DOTS client operators retain that operational control, but uh, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, yeah, it's, it control, control is the wrong word, uh, because this is a communications medium, right? Uh, and as you said, we're not trying to enforce you know, the contractual relationship. We're just trying to facilitate the communication. So you know, whatever um, you know, timers uh, or you know, whatever you know, um, special rules that allow for you know, a forced uh, mitigation termination from a DOTS client to a DOTS server, that's almost really almost outside the scope of DOTS in my opinion. Thanks. Um, so I guess the, the last one that's uh, really worthy of discussion here on this, this slide is the uh, required and optional mitigation scope types. So previous revisions had listed some example scope types, but they were examples. They were not uh, required uh, or optional. So uh, the required scope types now are uh, the obvious ones, you know, IPv4, dotted quad, uh, IPv4 prefixes, IPv6 addresses and prefixes, and uh, fully qualified domain names. 
Uh, the optional type right now, there's only one of them, so you know, feel free to suggest others, is a URI. Um, and we previously also had listed in the examples E164 telephone numbers, um, but you can actually encode those as a URI, so that's, I think that covers it. And URI covers lots of different schemes as well. Um, so we have, I think, eight or nine remaining open issues. Uh, one of them that we discussed a bit yesterday during the design team meetings is uh, the definition of what a session is. Um, if you look through previous revisions of the signal channel, sorry, of the uh, requirements draft, um, there's this kind of loose use of the term session, uh, more or less interchangeable with this, the channel itself. So I've just gone through, I have a pull request now uh, that replaces session with channel, and that may just resolve both of these things. Uh, you know, getting Dave's input on this will probably uh, let us know if we're moving in the right direction. Um, the issue number six is something I think is probably just a deletion. We already have, in, under the security requirements, a uh, requirement for mutual auth. I think this is just a leftover. Um, I'm going to skip 16 for the moment. Uh, and then we have some NAT considerations right now, but they are uh, implicitly client only. Um, so we need to have some server NAT considerations, you know, whether UPnP is something we need to, to uh, add to the requirements draft here, a uh, reference to it anyway. Um, so issue 16 is uh, how overlapping requests should be, should be handled. Let's say you have uh, multiple DOTS clients. Um, they detect the same attack separately. There's no, no coordination between them. They both ask for mitigation for the same attack. How does the DOTS server resolve that? Um, I've become less enamored of the idea that the DOTS server be responsible for resolving that. Uh, I, I feel like this might have to be an implementation specific thing. The dot server turns to the mitigator or whatever is responsible for, for uh, installing filters or doing the, the, uh, uh, putting the appropriate countermeasures in place. Uh, and depending on what the mitigator says is okay, the dot server either rejects or adds the mitigation. That's about it. Well, the dominant server networks, as far as I know, there's no concept of mitigation scope within dots, right? Again, as you indicate, that's something that is really out, outside I um, mean, you know, outside the boundaries of the DOT system now, you know, the, the client will say, okay, I, I'm requesting mitigation, you know, for this particular side or block, right, or for this particular, you know, URI or what have you. But in the, the, the actual configuration of the mitigation scope within the DDoS orchestration system that's operated by the DDoS mitigation service provider is we need, we, we don't want to get into that because then we're going to start constricting DOTs to a particular paradigm of DDoS mitigation that relies on a specific technology path. We don't, we don't want to do that. Um, could you go back one slide, please? One more. Uh, one, uh, where, where, where was the part about the FQDN? Uh, it's, it's under the uh, issue 15. Uh, 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 oh, okay, sorry, it was in the slide. So do you really mean FQDN or do you mean like the zone cut? Because FQDN has, has a very specific meaning. It is, it is a very specific meaning. And the, I initially just had, I had domain names as the initial language. Yeah. And then some, uh, I had some input from another one of the editors who suggested replacing with fully qualified domain names. So that's what's there. Yeah, I think we probably replace FQDN with something else because otherwise that implies that we're only able to put a, an FQDN in a DOTS uh, mitigation request to a name from a client. When in reality, we might want to say like, you know, star dot, you know, uh, example dot, EDU okay. or something so every, like that. Every, every subdomain under a certain. Okay. Sorry, we missed the key. <clears throat> Fleming and Jason. Uh, the overlapping request handling. I understand why you know you prefer on the server side not having to deal with it. I'm not convinced that's the right answer. Well, my concern is that I don't want to get into a scenario where requests are essentially client specific. Right, and a given client that had asked for something would have to be the one that gets rid of it as well. And if there are any kind of conflicts, right, somehow the clients have to coordinate amongst themselves, right? I, I don't think that's gonna be workable. So, I, I totally agree on that, yeah. So, so I think there's an issue in terms of when you specify I need mitigation for a certain scope, right? How does that get reconciled between multiple clients that are not necessarily coordinated? Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you would do that without having the servers and you'd be dealing with that overlap and yeah. resolving it on the back end. So the one thing that, that's been in the back of my mind, right, is this is, might be an appropriate place for the relay where we have that, that uh, the aggregation of the signaling uh, and the relay is responsible for doing that. Um, I don't know that that's any different than just having the server do it, right? Figuring out where the overlap is and, and merging them. Um, what, what what relay? Did I say? Oh, yes. Thank what, you. What, what gateway? gateway? What gateway? 
No, so what I'm saying is. No, I'm being serious, right? Because oh, no, I understand. Yeah, no, the the in one of our in the architecture we have this diagram right where there's this aggregated signaling right at multiple downstream, uh, then the gateway is responsible for sort of merging it into a single channel up to a dot server, uh, and that that aggregation sort of implies the merging of of of, uh, of these signal channels and the scopes. Um, but that's since the gateway is just a back-to-back -back server and client, I don't think that's any different than having the server do it. Uh, let me rephrase my question. Okay. Are you suggesting that we formally define what a gateway is and the responsibilities that it has? Because currently we don't. Oh, wow. Put me on the spot with that one. Uh, I'm not. Not right now. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with them. Yeah. So I think we got to chip away at this one. You know? yeah, I agree. All right, I think the remaining uh, open issues, none of these are, are particularly contentious in the way that the overlapping one is. Um, I think there is uh, some ambig ambiguity about what ownership and protected resources are. Uh, so we need to just uh, tighten the language there and get some consensus on that. Um, and adding a couple requirements for authentication and authorization, uh, this can just be put into the uh, security requirements section. There's a lot of implicit uh, understanding of what auth authentication and authorization is required. We just need to make that explicit. Uh, and finally, um, Dave brought this up uh, before the last inter meeting about um, the need for replay protection. Uh, my sense is that we need to be very careful here because uh, any ability to replay might have an impact on the ser dot server operator's network. Uh, so we should be, we should have uh, full replay protection in place. Um, there aren't too many other upcoming changes. I think the the one notable one is that the operational requirements section has really evolved into the signal channel requirements. Uh, I believe there's one remaining uh, operational requirement in there that we can just move to the general requirements. Um, that's relating to the NAT binding stuff. And then the remaining um, uh, requirements under the current operational requirements section will just be retitled signal channel requirements. Uh, and incorporation of uh, any minor corrections, typos, and so on. Um, please submit new issues as soon as you can. Um, we are working toward working group last call. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, the uh, the queue of issues, open issues, are the obstacle. That is the obstacle to working group last call. So the sooner we can get through that, the sooner we get to uh, working group last call. Thanks. Hi, Akana Minishizuka. Uh, with regard to the heartbeat discussion, uh, uh, do you think there could be a zero heartbeat mode? That is because uh, there could be a serverless, uh, any cast deployment of uh, sub, dot server uh, could be exist, could exist, I think. Right. I, so in, in the architecture draft, we have the, uh, the AnyCast consideration section where um, I think maybe we should make this clearer. We, we talk mostly about using it as a method for service discovery, right? It's a way to just, you use uh, uh, AnyCast.service address, uh, and then you get directed to the, the Unicast server that you should be using. Um, okay. uh, I think I think the yeah. So op uh, op two, mm -hmm. you think that uh, uh, must regularly send heartbeat. So yeah, right. In that case, so with any cast, you're you're concerned that a, a network change can then uh, yeah, yeah. I think maybe we should okay. discuss that offline. I'm not sure that I have a good answer for you right off the top of my head. Okay. Hey, Natik. I'm um, just to. Uh, Kind of makes point there on the zero heartbeat idea. Um, I think that might have value. I mean, there's the odd implement implement potential implementer who I've spoken to who wants to just spin things up on an ad hoc basis, you know, because they don't want to be maintaining multiple sessions from multiple customers potentially to multiple. Yeah. And so that that could have some value there initially. With that could be handled maybe via the data channel, I guess. You know, which could be just mitigation request additional. But if the signal channel had a zero heartbeat option, that right? And so then they they could just set it up. Set it up the channel, use a policy or event ID. Yeah, find session, exactly. Tear it down, do the same thing, resume the session, use yeah. the detailed session. Yes, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, other questions and comments? Okay, in that case, we'll move on to the next draft, which is the architecture. And Andrew, you still have the floor.
right, so <clears throat> this is uh, this is going to be quite brief. Um, I know we have a lot of other things to discuss, so I'll just keep this moving. Uh, like the DOTS requirements, we are tracking open issues on the GitHub issue tracker under the DOTS WG uh, group. Um, we only have a couple remaining issues right now. The document itself is kind of paused while we're waiting on changes to the use cases and, and requirements. Uh, I think the, the recent movement on both of those drafts is, uh, is getting us into a position where we can make uh, the tweaks that are necessary and we can get ourselves to work working group last call soon. Um, the issues that we have closed recently do cover things like service discovery, uh, any cast, and uh, the, the need for redirection in the DOTS architecture. Uh, these have been closed for uh, quite a while, but um, and, and all of those changes are in the existing draft. So uh, if you have issues or concerns about the, the current discussion of any of these topics, please take another look and uh, bring it up on the working group mailing list or simply open an issue. We only have a couple remaining issues, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the question for the use cases. Um, Multi-homed DOTS clients are still something that we need to, to sort out. Um, <coughs> I, I would like to talk more with the use cases authors on this so we can try to coordinate and come to uh, I think something that's mutually agreeable. Uh, and then finally, things like uh, privacy and visibility for recursive signaling. Um, this has been a concern about the, uh, if you need to have, uh, let's say a mitigator wants DPI into uh, encrypted traffic, um, are there concerns about sh sharing private keys? Uh, and if you're using this sort of backstop recursive signaling, uh, but that really covers it on the, the architecture draft right now. Um, largely, it's going to be some coordination with the requirements and use cases drafts. Uh, and then if we can knock out the remaining two issues, I think we're ready for working group last call. Again, submit any issues you have with the current draft as soon as you can so we can uh, keep track of what actually is remaining before the working group last call. Uh, Kathleen Moriarty, AD. Um, I'm sorry, I hadn't read that part and just hearing you say DPI, man in the middle, traffic, that's gonna hit a bleep storm. Yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not advocating for it. It's just a concern about, uh, do we need to mention the, the concern about privacy and security uh, if somebody is, is advocating for this in the architecture draft? We're not necessarily advocating for the sharing of these private keys. Why wouldn't you just have a requirement that prohibits it? I'm sorry, I didn't... A requirement that prohibits it. Uh, do we want to impose that on somebody that you can't? What are you wrapping this in? What, um, using TLS? Uh, that's, that's likely, yeah. So when you go to 1.3, mm -hmm. that's already done that. There's the, the other uh, static to and stuff that's going on as well, right? So, I mean, there's... Yes, I agree with you. Uh, yeah, not in IETF, um, yeah. not in a working group, right? Not in a working group. Yeah. Um, it might go through the independent stream editor. Mm -hmm. I haven't agreed to AD sponsor it, and I don't think Ecker would. Okay. So we'll have to see what happens, but um, right. yeah, I don't I, know. I, I don't think it's I'm, appropriate. I'm not advocating to... for this, right? This was an issue brought up by one of the other editors, and we've been trying to figure out is this something we need to treat in the architecture draft? All right, I'll, well, when at least by the time it gets to my review, I'll look at it and see if it needs to be in this draft at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're doing a negative statement against it, that would probably be fine. Mm -hmm. um, maybe dropping it completely might be your best bet. Yeah, okay, thank you. Will and Dobbins, Urban Networks. Um, a couple of the issues that are still outstanding uh, for architecture as well as for requirements, they require some fairly dense discussions that might, I mean, we want to keep things on the list as much as possible, but that doesn't preclude having interactive discussions and then summarizing for everybody on the list. Um, so maybe we can think about having um, a, uh, an actual meeting, you know, a con call to, with for interested parties to uh, discuss these issues sometime. Uh, relatively quickly because I think with some interactive discussions we can kind of go through and, and knock some more of these down more quickly than we could trying to trade uh, messages on the list. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, I would even settle for any discussion on the mailing list at this point <laughs> on those issues. Would there be interest for us to do a virtual interim around, virtual interim around this or? Sorry, just one question. Uh, timeline for this, when do you need it? 
next week two weeks two weeks from here okay so you 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 come to us and tell us sure. and we do it yeah okay thank you other things related to the architecture documents comments concerns feedback All right, thank you, Andrew. So next up on the agenda, we're gonna pivot to talk about different protocol and solution-oriented drafts. First up is uh, draft ready dots data channel that Nick is gonna be talking about. And uh, for those that did not see the announcement on the man list, this is the draft we're talking about to pull for adoption. Hey, I'm Nick Teague. Um... I'm here to present on this one, um, Tiru could make it. And it's really, this is this is really more of a recap of the discussions we've had over the last couple of months and also um, the bits and bits and pieces from the interim meeting. Um, the main reason why I want to recap it is because after the last meeting, um, we had a, bit, a number of discussions between myself, Andrew, Tiru, um, and a couple of others. And we decided that the as far as the data channel goes, the, a lot of the efforts were converging anyway. So we decided to just converge onto this one draft. Um, so to that end, um, the data channel is using RESTConf. There were Yang models in there. They're cool, they're Yang, they're funky. Um, the updated draft meets all the requirements as, as it has been. It's been pretty much in line. Uh, this draft has been pretty much in line with um, requirements all the way along. Still sitting on top of the, the stack that's very, very familiar, the RESTConf, TLS, TCP, IP, with dots sitting on top of it. Um, the rest conf was suggested and it seemed to make some sense. Um, it's obviously a subset of netconf. It's not as heavy as netconf, so we feel it might provide less overhead as far as like implementation goes. Um, but then kind of in, it allows us to basically use some commonality across other efforts as well. Um, it addresses the needs of what we need as far as like configuration and so on. Um, You've got the general kind of what you would expect, post, put, delete, um, get to retrieve config data and non-config. Um, there was a TLS heartbeat for liveliness. It's generally speaking, the, the data channel's reasonably um, connection-oriented anyway, so it will, it will be maintaining that as it goes along. Um, we've got a number of YAN models in there already, and then we've got the, the ability to expand upon that as well as we go. A um, couple of our options, well, a couple of examples as identify a model filter model the identify one as it was discussed earlier regarding things like fqdn and the discussion on that it, it, the, the idea is to basically assign an alias at the time of the um, actual mitigation that instead of having to kind of define every single individual element you can just say oh use alias one and that references ip address this let's port this service for this so it kind of ties in a few of those together and then it can be expanded as we go along at the minute we've got fqdn uh, uri e164 in there and stuff so it can just, you know, as we as we wish and as we as we see fit, we can pad that out. And that's pretty much it. I mean, it's just it's. I think we've um, we've all come along the same path of um, the type of things we want in this this particular draft and and how it's been going. And it, we've all been kind of getting there. Um, so that's me done. Any questions, comments? So just agenda-wise, we built some time uh, here to talk about are we ready for adoption of this as a working group kind of artifact. We're not going to decide today. We have a poll out on the mailing list uh, because with travel and everything, there's two more weeks to provide your, your thinking on this after IETF finishes. But again, we have time in the agenda if you would like to share your feelings endorsing this or you have some concerns and you'd like them voiced. Fleming Andreas, um, I'm supportive. As I said on the mailing list, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think the direction that it's going as well makes a lot of sense, which to me is more of a separation of the data channel and the signaling channel, right? This really is operational stuff, I mean, configuration-related data, and the signal channel can then leverage that data later on. So I like it. By the way, it's not to say that there aren't any, it's, but it's still not being worked on. I mean, Dave raised some... Um, some comments before regarding um, the idea, again, comments around the ideas of session, but also the comments around the, the ideas of coupling and so on that we need to look at. 
Uh, absolutely, Nick. I mean, just to clarify, adopting this as a working group document does not accept and and it all suggests that what is in that draft is is concrete. It is completely malleable. It's just that we're accepting the existing text as a working group artifact. I'm Oscar's HD Consulting. I'm all for this being a working group document. It keeps one aspect simple, so we can keep our focus on the, the really driving part, which is the signal channel. Okay, thank you. Then that moves us to the next part. Yeah, I'm on hook this one as well. Yes, the signal channel, which is more int maybe more challenging. Let's say it this way. Okay, so um, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I wanted to present this one in the absence of Tiru is because I wanted to give some color around why uh, why we're sort of converging around this one. Um, the Actually, I'll leave it on that one. So there was um, a protocol document that we put forward, um, which supported protobufs and a more more of a beaconing type um, signaling. There was this one, which was using co-op and Seabor, and there was some other variations on there. Again, what we we had a discussion after the last meeting, and we uh, we we came to the conclusion that we would like to just, again try and converge on a single path, um, just to reduce the amount of duplication and so on. Um, to that end, we've kind of decided that in the absence of being able to kind of standardize on protobufs at this particular time, then what we thought we could do is at a later date maybe use it as a content type. Um, we were using protobufs in our original draft as an IDL um, and leveraging that. In the newer draft, that um, in newer revisions that Tiru put together and stuff, it had moved more towards that, towards a similar aspect, Seabor having a similar aspect of, as. Um, uh, as protobufs, things like the mapping and so on, the element mapping. The, in addition to that, also from having discussions with Fleming and so on, um, what we saw was we, we didn't really want to go through the, the rigmarole of reinventing TCP or UDP and congestion control and all these type of things. You know, the co-op can handle that for us. So, um, so with this one, the highlights is again, we have the Yang in there. It's, um, there's a mitigation request model, configuration model, and so on. Um, Including rules defined in the uh, core Yang Seabor. Um, and it compiles nicely, currently. Um, Seabor, again, is being used, all parameters of signal channel and map to Seabor types. We're using particular types and mappings to ensure that we can just, again, make it a bit more efficient rather than kind of complete, uh, constantly reiterating through the schema every time we send a message, um, which was a big, a big issue I had kind of between JSON encoding versus, say, something like protocols. Um, the mitigation response and the request are now marked as non-confirmable. Um, the non-confirmable requests are sent at regular intervals until a response is received. That was something else that we kind of were that was that was that we, we thought needed shaping in this one, and Tiru did a good job of getting it in there. Um, channel configuration setup are flagged as convert confirmable. So we, we have sort of have the best of both worlds, as in we have confirmable messages when we need them, non-confirmable when we don't, and we go from there. Um, what we've decided to do, I think, as well, is try and keep it so that we have st static types. We, we've kind of tried to remove some of the ambiguity of, oh, in peacetime, we could have confirmable, you know, and so on. So what we've done is, like, these ones will always be of this particular characteristic. These other ones will be always of that characteristic. So there's no ambiguity in figuring out what, you know, kind of various aspects of what peacetime is versus, you know, uh, what, it, you know, uh, wartime is. Um, the heartbeat mechanism is using the co-op ping. Um, we're looking at DTLS 1.3. Um, there's support in there for event-specific parameters, which we feel is important um, for extensibility and so on. Um, added new mitigation status parameters, which are somewhat useful for the endpoint to be able to figure out what's going on. Um, it's like a very basic, a basic level of telemetry for the, um, for the originator to be able to figure out you know what as far as like is is the attack ongoing is the attack not ongoing what's it seeing um it can then provide a degree of status yes Andrew. uh so with regard to uh, uh sorry andrew mortensen uh the uh tls versions uh do you think that we are going to be blocked waiting for dtls 1.3 uh 
um, uh, this morning. I mean, it, it's there are no competing DTLS drafts, right? But it's still an individual draft. And I'm just yeah. wondering. I, I'm not asking you to choose, but no, uh, whether we we need to, uh, I think, decide if we're waiting on it. Yeah. Overall, DTLS has been a bit of a well. The DTLS has been a bit of a pain in this. Um, not so much because of DTLS itself, but the available libraries out there are painful, <laughs> to say the least, to try and get to do what we wanted to do. Um, there's either uh, you know, they're just either lacking or they're just so hard to work with. They're just, they're just not there. Um, so that that's pretty much it. So it was this, you know, this, again, we're 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 trying to move towards this to consult towards consolidation. I'm not sure whether we're completely ready to to say that this one is ready for adoption yet, but that doesn't mean we couldn't ask the question. And again, comments and questions, welcome. Maybe as a chair, quick question. Why do you say you think it's n not ready yet? Um, my, my personal opinion is we just need to refine it a bit more, and that's maybe just being a bit precious. Um, it's it's more it's probably it's it's I would guess I guess it's more cosmetic than anything else. My opinion is that I, oops, my opinion is that I just feel we need to kind of like maybe just refine it and just have it flow a little better. And I think that's something that's actually been working through in the most in the most recent variation, the most recent version. And I think it'll be out in the next version as well. And I think we're very close to it, but I just think there's a, a few tweaks and everything there just to, you know, just before we go with it. Having said that, like I said, that's not to say we couldn't ask the question. Fleming Andreas. <clears throat> so I very much support the notion of trying to converge on a single document. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, what this group needs to produce, right, are protocol specifications in the end. Um, well, one of each, one for the data, one for yes. the signal, right? Not multiple of them. And the sooner we can get to that point, right, the better. Um, in terms of, you know, where do we focus our energy, right? I mean, we had the information model as well. Yeah. The reason that we had that, right, quite frankly, is because we have had competing uh, protocol suggestions in there, right? The data model is in here already, right? Same thing for the, uh, the data channel. So if we could find a way of converging on a single protocol uh, for the signal channel, I think that would be very helpful to the group overall. So I would certainly support it from that point of view. Cool. And you know, I, I think it looks reasonable, right? Uh, as as a starting point. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, what's in there at the minute? Like, I don't really have any issues with the content or that. So we just need to. It's just flow and, like I said, cosmetic. Yeah, I mean, there are plenty of details still, right? That you know, yeah. you want to change. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Moskowitz, I do have two concerns from what you said, Nick. Actually, one that, that Andrew said. Um, TLS, DTLS 1.3 blocking. Mm -hmm. What's the consequences of that? That, uh, you no, know, what, you know, what is it that, why do we want 1.3 and, and thus the blocking? We may, we may need to call that out. The other thing is the comment you mentioned about detail, actual DTLS implementations and issues regard to that is so, so to, is there uh, experience which is showing us something that we that we'll be need to be concerned with or and again maybe some implementation recommendations which we may need, may need to stay say in the in the as as informational information but something may have to put in the document with regard to actual yes. experience no I, I think those are both great comments and as far as our implementation goes implementation attempts have gone I think what we've found and where we've had heartaches is because we've been trying to get this working for a little while and in our very in our various efforts and it's it's like just trying to get the one that's you know that ticks all the boxes that we, we feel we need. Having said that, I think if we if we do start to consolidate on single draft and we're starting to kind of say, well, now we can start to talk about this stuff, then we can start to then dig deeper, figure out what is what we need, what's lacking, what we can tolerate, you know, even yes, and, sure. and so on. And then we can figure out, well, is it is this a blocker or can we go to do something else, you know, is is the, for example, I think Andrew used uh, tiny SSL, um, which had an implementation that might not be great, but would it be sufficient, you know? So that there, there's those questions to come up, but yes, I think your comments are, are well noted. Thank you. Hi, Andrew Wenson. Uh, I think I'm kind of responsible for the uh, question about whether we should adopt now, but uh, that was on revision 09. Um, revision 10 has incorporated a bunch of stuff and I would be okay talking about Adoption at this point. Maybe, maybe that is indeed then a question to ask. Um, maybe before I ask that, we should ask who has read documents. 
Okay, so, okay, who has read draft ready dot signal channel version eight, nine, or ten? Because that makes the castle a bit. Okay, so that's a couple of roughly ten, twelve. Keep your hand roughly. Okay, just okay. That, I think that's a sizable amount of people. So, um, ask you. Actually, shall we ask now? Let's ask okay, let's be let's be let's be aggressive and <laughs> let's ask now. So, who would be? Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the question. Who would be comfortable? No, who is in favor of adding adopting this as a working group draft? The answer would be yes, no, or don't know. So, who is in favor? Yes. Or shall we hand uh, hum? I think it's hum is probably more adequate. Sorry. So hum now. Or the oh, AD has no. something to say. Kathleen wants to get new Yeah, you want to move to a location. Oh, 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 okay. You're a strong hummer. So if you're in favor of adopting hum now, please. Okay. Who is against that? Hum now, please. Okay, I think that is reasonably good. Uh, abstains, you can hum. Okay, <laughs> I think that is quite good consensus to adopt. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so this brings us to uh, to an exciting part uh, of the agenda from a working group's perspective to actually talk about implementations of some of these protocols. So we have two up. So Konami is up first talking about the entity implementation. Hi, I'm Kanami Nishizuka from NVT Communications. Today I'd like to share you the implementation experience and the findings in this short presentation. Okay, uh, now we are developing a dot client server software, which is on the specifications uh, on the, these uh, drafts, which are uh, now uh, in, in this room. And uh, I just say it's working well, uh, though it is not pre implemented the dot software. And it will be open sourced with PSV3 cloud license. Uh, it is an uh, early implementation, however, it is aimed to implement full dot protocol specification in accordance with maturing of dot protocol itself. And we can show you a demo at any time, so uh, please contact us. Uh, I'm available after this meeting at any time at, uh, at in the rest of IETF meeting. Excuse me, can I, can I stop you? Which versions of those drafts did you implement? Okay, uh, it is not written uh, clearly. Uh, dead, I'm sorry. Dead, dead channel is the uh, uh, previous rated draft, and signal channel is based on version 7. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, he, uh, this figure shows the uh, outline of our application. The core of uh, application is the dot communication channel between dot client and server. The dot client uh, sends a dot message to dot server in cop of a DTLS as dot signal. The dot server receives that signal and then it validates it. Uh, the validates a message format and the content itself of the dot signal and then uh, determine whether the signal should be handed over to further process. Then uh, dot server uh, start mitigation by handing over the signal to pluggable blockers uh, as mitigators. We chose GoBGP as the first pluggable blockers which enabled RTB8 low spec or diversion in any BGP network. So we, we expand the capable interface uh, to utilize other devices, which will be over SSH or other protocols. Finally, the dot server will be able to send dot message to other dot enabled devices as uh, the dot gateway functionality. Okay, 
Okay, uh, the software is implemented in Golang. As an implementation experience, I, I can assure you that the core specification of Signal is made sure to be implemented. However, uh, finding good libraries, such as Coop, RESCONF, and uh, especially DTLS, is rather, still rather difficult. So we are trying several DTLS libraries. However, we haven't found any good DTLS, DTLS library which will really work with the specification of dot signal channel. Then, uh, uh, okay. yeah. uh, Andrew Martins, regarding the uh, DTLS libraries, are you, it, there is no native Golang DTLS library right now, right? There's some that implements uh, the Golang DTLS, which is uh, wrapping OpenSSL, is that correct? Is that what you're using? Uh, sorry, uh, there is no native Golang library, so I use C library and call mm -hmm. it from Golang. Okay, yeah, the, uh, uh, we, uh, yeah. yeah the, the one that I, I have been trying to use is a uh, tiny DTLS, which implements the sort of their uh, requirements for co-op. I don't know if you've taken a look at that, but it's it was the best that I found. Yeah, yeah. I use the uh, Ulf SSL, uh, however, which is only using DTLS 1.2. Okay, uh, I'd like to show you two issues uh, found in the implementation experience. Uh, first one is about the coupling of data channel and signal channel. The signal ch ch channel draft says the DTLS or TLS based client certificate must be used for mutual authentication. And the dot server couples the dot signal and data channel session using the dot client identity. So two drafts require the same common name for client side in DTLS of signal channel and TLS of data channel. I think this is strong restriction for uh, implementation and deployment. So if DOT is going to use other mutual authentication technologies, it needs generalized concept of CN, I think. We, uh, we, I'm wondering, uh, the customer organization or mitigation ID team uh, should be in, uh, included in signal and data messages. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jeff Hodges. You, you don't need to really be using the CN as the subject name. You should probably be looking at using the subject alternative name extension and mapping to DNS in that. Okay, yeah, you, you don't need to use a distinguish, a next 500 distinguished name in, in the subject. You can put whatever you want in there, but you really should be leveraging subject alternative name. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Fleming and Reyes, I, I agree completely with your observation. This is, you know, what we were alluding to, I think, before as well with your authentication and authorization model and also the separation of the signal and data channel. The way it is right now is not right. I mean, the signal channel and data channel are independent, right? It's the data that's being conveyed over them that you have to reconcile in the back end. And we have to have an authentication or authorization model that works for that. I think right now it says it's based on the dots, you know, client uh, ID or something like that. I agree, I think it's too narrow, right? I think that should be a more flexibility in that. To what extent we need to specify that versus that becomes, you know, a back end operator issue, I'm less sure. Okay, uh, the separation of data channel and the signal channel is the uh, second issue, so I'd like to show you the second point. Okay, and uh, at, uh, in the implementation experience, we, found, we realized that uh, data channel only host, uh, signal, uh, signal channel only host can exist, and it is uh, useful in some time. So, okay, uh, if the, the, they are separated, so data channel and signal channel are separated, the dot client for data channel can be placed in different locations, there would be less probability of uh, suffering from attacks uh, than the place of signal channel only devices. So in order to couple those channels, uh, some common background or space or some context is needed, I think. However, if uh, the, this uh, situation is useful, I'd like to uh, add some use case to our 
I'll just get the rough, I think. I'll just what, about it. Let me address the end. Um, absolutely, I think there is such a use case. Agreed. Thank you. Sorry, just a, just a plus one Fleming. Um, I agree there is a use case. Um, I can see many occasions when that might be useful for whatever reason. Um, and it, to have, either have separation in the domain or to have clients that are, again, like we said before, either single signal only or data channel or combined, but spread out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Is that, that's not captured right now in the current text? I'm confirming. I don't think it's captured in that. I don't think context. So yeah, I think it. I think you could imply it, but I don't think it's actually captured. Yeah, I think you've got final slide. I I apologize uh, just to make it explicit. So if it's not in the use case draft clearly enough, then that means it needs to be clarified there. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, Andrew Mortensen, uh, I was wondering if you had any, if you'd done anything toward client provisioning at all, or bootstrapping, or if uh, that's still coming down the road. Oh, sorry, uh, could I have uh, Client provisioning, yeah. So, so the, getting the keying material to uh, them and so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now uh, I'm just using uh, some uh, those client software which only reading a JSON file which writing about the request of the mitigation. So yeah, yeah we need some kind of provisioning strategy. Bob Moskowitz, um, this last slide where the, you had the one data channel with multiple um, signal channels pretty much flies in the face of your previous comment about how to connect the two authentications together to pair them up because you basically have almost like a uh, uh, reverse multicast sort of a, a situation here or how the identities are going to be done. This is going to take some real serious um, thought about how to do the, uh, um, the identity control such that you have what linkage you want. It's an interesting use case, but it's going to take some real serious um, um, thought on how to do it. I'm feeling uncomfortable with it. Okay, yeah, we can discuss about that. Uh, Jefferson Aubrey Nicinos. You mentioned, I think, in the first uh, or second slide that you're open source the code, right? So my question is, um, do you have a timeline for that? Or when are you planning to deliver the code, to release the code? OK, uh, now I'm trying to uh, talk to our uh, some <laughs> legal department. <laughs> I don't know uh, uh, how how long it will it take, so I cannot promise you. However, it will be between uh, this IETF meeting and the next IETF meeting. Okay. Fleming Andreas, and just responding to Bob's comments before, I actually don't see them at odds uh, with each other at all. I think they're very well aligned, the two use case scenarios that you have there. Um, I think it's very common, right? It, it's not the channels that are being bound together, right? It's the data that they're operating on and controlling access to that data that needs to be sorted out. Um, I, I don't see anything at all there. Okay, uh, this is the last slide. So, oh. The last word from me is that I will, uh, I will start to implement a heartbeat part. It is not implemented yet, so I will implement heart, heartbeat part of signal channel according to the updated signal channel draft. And then uh, I will make a further feedback to this working group later. Then. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Comment as the chair, this is awesome. So I've been long hoping to see the first implementations being presented, and this is really very, very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Kanami. Yeah, thank you. Uh, administratively, before we move to the next presentation, uh, where is the blue sheet? Who needs the blue sheet? Okay, if we could just pass the blue sheets up to whoever needs the blue sheet, thank you.
Uh, Fleming, you're up. If you could tell us about your implementation. So uh, <clears throat> I can tell you about Tiro's implementation. It's, uh, <laughs> it's it's not mine, so I will do my best. You know. Um, all right, so if you recall the presentation that we did at the last IETF, there was actually a couple of slides in there about the uh, proof of concept that was done back then. And it's pretty similar, actually, in terms of the information that's in here. Uh, the major difference is that the proof of concept implementation has been updated to reflect the latest draft. So in terms of the overall framework here, California, especially on the server side, that's the same as you saw the last time. Uh, you can go online, of course, and uh, download it yourself if you want to play around with it. Uh, there are various APIs in here. Uh, as Nick was mentioning, right, there is things related to congestion control uh, that are important. Uh, message transmission parameters, uh, heartbeat timeouts, which we're specifying as part of the overall DOS protocol operation. And then the new part here about messages being confirmable or non-confirmable, uh, so that's being leveraged as well now in the uh, new proof of concept that Tira has done. The client side is browser-based, so there is a plugin, Copper. Uh, again, there's a URL here where you can go fetch that. Uh, that will enable you to essentially come up with your own messages, and then you can send those to the server, and you can play around with those, and that's essentially what's been done. And here's an example of those. Uh, again, you see we have an example here of a non-confirmable message. Um, Seabor is what we're using. And this is another. There's a way of actually decoding some of these messages uh, back and forth if you wanted to see. Uh, there's a URL for that as well. So this is just basically illustrating you an example message here, how it's been actually encoded and uh, what's being sent across. Um, so that is it for the proof of concept uh, from Tiro. <coughs> Any questions or comments on that? Okay, thank you, Fleming. Thank you. So we just had two implementations. Are there is there a third one lurking that anyone wants to to bring up or aspiration for implementation? Uh, Barry Green from Akamai. I think um, in hallway conversations leading up to this, and, and I did last week a read through of all our docs from the point of view of implementing. Um, as um, Russ White and I were talking, we don't want this to go down the path of CIDR. All right, so I think we need to instigate implementations. All right, so I think we're in a phase where it's not just asking who's implementing, I think it's um, there are there's um, efforts where you can have several companies get together and says, okay, we're going to instigate, we're going to pay some university to go do it. Or you can, you got governments who throw money at projects like this. You know, it's, I think um, now's the time to start. You know, and several people, you know, involved with drafts are saying like, oh, we're not ready yet. It says, okay, no, now's the time to start to instigate the implementation, our roadmap of deployment, right? Because we, we want to make sure that we come to fruition to, for this work. We got to get our roadmap of deployment. It means we got to have the code, we have the prototype, we have to validate, make sure it's done. You start that now, get the funding now, right? Like I don't know, you know, on the, uh, you know, like for instance, have you guys CC'd? <laughs> no, right, <laughs> right. If if we don't we don't if we don't have vendors starting a CC process, a concept commit process, these are the sort of things we need to start getting going with it. Because as you start it now. You know, we get two more IETFs. You know, we're making some good progress on the specifications. Things will get closed out, and as we get more people using the docs, you know, we'll we'll find and discover things and tune the work. So, if there's, I think, if there's anybody interested in this, I think we can get a side little instigation sort of of discussions going on and start uh, rolling this out, and then in the next IETF report out for the working group is to have a section of saying, okay, what's the result of our efforts of getting things moving on more implementation operational deployment? That's my two cents. Thank you. I completely agree. A any other vendors or researchers want to speak up about their planned implementations?
Yeah. Yeah, so two things that Tobias and I've been talking about are first, now that we're talking about individual specifications, do we want to start doing this as part of the hackathon uh, that's held the, the Saturday before IETF, perhaps in Prague uh, or Singapore? And given that we have two implementations, at what point do we start talking about interop uh, between them? So things on our minds. Uh, if you're interested, please do let us know. Okay. So uh, the last item on our agenda is not directly related to some of the specific architectures we've been kind of talking about. So next up is talking about IP fix usage. So Marvin. All right, this is Marvin Zhonghui from Huawei. Um, I'm gonna give you a br brief update on this draft. Okay. All right, this is content. I will go through the background, the changes from the last iteration, ideas, issues, and next step. Uh, the main main purpose of this presentation is to do some clarifications. So the background, as you'll see, why would an IP fix job appear in the dots working group? The first thing is um, actually our job targets at the same problem space that we want to solve that dots attacks. Uh, but the approaches we the approaches we are taken we are taking are different differently as you have learned that dots is more about signaling, building the signaling mechanism, but our job is uh, more about building a data analysis platform. So so that's the difference. Um, so uh, this is, yes, as the uh, working group chairs, just this is a little bit off the, the scope of DOTS. So uh, this, the reason why we submit this uh, revised dra draft is um, because it's a little bit about the history. The original draft was here, so we want to present the new um, Update job here. Maybe we can hear some opinions from the floor about uh, security issues. All right. So <clears throat> the next slide. Uh, what we propose in this draft is actually a collection of IP fix uh, information elements. As you can see on the left, that's the original set of IP fix elements in the last iteration uh, so in this in the new draft we have um, reviewed the uh, IP fix elements and we have actually removed a lot of IP fix uh, elements because uh, the removed IP fix elements they can be implemented using the ex existing uh, elements through some combination or complex structures. So this is a maybe a lesson learned for you. That if you want to add some new um, IP fix information elements, you should really look at the existing ones. All right. Uh, so what's left in the new draft is uh, is all about TCP connection tracking. Uh, that's that's a the concept we would like to promote. So. <clears throat> As I said before, we like to build a data analysis platform. So, uh, so we want to collect a certain information from TCP connections, and it's it's, it's by a um, it's by using big data technologies. I am using this buzzword because because the information we collect from the TCP connections don't have to be very accurate. Actually, we just want to monitor the changes, the behavioral changes of those characteristics in those TCP connections. So, so why choose um, IP fix? Because we need some uh, mechanism to export those information from TCP, TCP traffic. And um, as you know, that IP fix is more standard and is widely supported. So we just need to add some new um, information elements. So this 
is the main idea, okay? If you look at the diagram, uh, what's lack? What's what, what's lacked in the IDFX uh, information elements is the some of the uh, some of the information related to TCP that set up or the timing information. For example, the timing information that is related to uh, the, the TCP three-way handshake, uh, which is used to set up a TCP connection. Um, some attacks may uh, result in a um, very abnormal that changes in those times. So uh, we believe collecting of collecting this kind of information is and processes it in um, in a statistical way can help us detect anomaly in TCP traffic. Uh, what so what do, do we mean by TCP connection tracking? As as you know, that TCP has certain signaling flex. So we want to have some flex set for all those that TCP signaling flex. Uh, if we um, observe a sync, then we observed a sync act that's normal, but we set the flex only if those flex occur in the connection in a normal sequence. If it's not in the normal sequence, then we will not uh, set those information. We will not, not set those flex. So by collecting this information, we will, it will be easier for us to tear apart what the TCP traffic is doing, all right? Uh, we also want to incorporate some of the informations about the <coughs> the packet um, the, the time intervals between different TCP segments because that might be um, exploited by the attackers. So uh, these these are a uh, basic set of information we'd like to collect from TCP connections. Um, next. We do realize there are certain issues regarding our solution. The first one is uh, asymmetric, asymmetric traffic. As we know, the internet is more and more is becoming more and more asymmetric. So this will limit the um, applicability of, of our solution because we need to collect the, the information from a conversion point that can. Um, observe both the uplink and downlink TCP traffic. Uh, they, they also, there are also some concerns about the performance. Yes, um, if, if the traffic is really uh, extreme, the, the volume of the tra traffic is really uh, large, that might require a super power device deployed on the conversion point to collect such kind of information. So these are major two issues that we, we are now uh, facing. And basically, uh, so as I said, this is just some clarification from the, from, for this uh, working group. So I, we, we appreciate that we had some discussions in the email list, and we appreciate the all the comments you've given to us. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next step we um, we are going to take might be uh, we might submit our IDFX information elements directory to uh, IANA, the IANA. But the reason we are doing another reason we are doing this presentation is because. Uh, we want to solicit comments from you as, as much as possible. So, thank you. Any questions or comments? No, thanks. Barry, comment? Um, so, what I would suggest, because this, it, it, it's okay to, to vet the student, I mean, use this as a vetting mechanism as a working group. Um, but this would be an individual submission document, correct? Uh, currently, it's not. It There's is, no working group. 
right? So, so then you would do an individual submission document, submit it to IANA. Hmm. IANA is going to have a uh, question um, who's going to be the uh, technical reviewers. Right. So the question to the working group is, would we be appropriate technical reviewers? So to, to clarify, the uh, IP fix registry is expert review? Expert review. It's right. expert review, right. not specification. Right. Right. And, and there is an, a list of names for expert reviewers, reviewers for IP fix extensions. So I think you just submit and see what they start getting the feedback from them directly. All right. Thanks. Yeah, Joel Yegley, you're just going to submit it and they're going to say yay or nay and it'll be super simple. So it should be no big deal. Right. Well. What? <laughs> you know, maybe I'll just be off one. Can we use the mic if we want to follow up on that? Uh, Kathleen Moriarty, AD. I'll follow up with Joel. I had some thoughts while you were presenting as well and thinking, you know, um, see if the, what the chairs had suggested and seeing that the, um, the uh, I could fix doctors if they were okay with it. Um, Another thing, and just looking at the what you're proposing, it looks like a lot of the types of things we see that come from the ops area, in terms of the, the types of measurements. And um, you know, when we look at security considerations for them, we just couch it and, and frame it um, down to what's minimally necessary, and and try to do it the best we can to protect the data. So there's ways to look at it, and. Uh, there, there's probably a way to get this done, either here or in ops. Yeah, I mean, I think those are, Joel Yegley again, I think those are surmountable obstacles, right? I mean, when you're dealing with proprietary data in a management system, uh, obviously you have to protect it in certain ways. And, um, you know, um, in security sensitive environments, um, that requires that you put bumpers around the description in your document. but that is actually the normal operational paradigm for this kind of information because you wouldn't you wouldn't want to leak it even if it didn't have this stuff on there. All right, thank you for that. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. So, we'll yeah, so on the agenda, we actually have time for open mic. So if anyone has any thoughts, comments, or concerns to share with the working group, please. Please get in the queue. Uh, so with regard to uh, DTLS and the version, and whether we're going to be blocked on 1.3, uh, if you look at the individual submission of the DTLS 1.3 draft right now, it says that uh, DTLS 1, 2, and 3 are uh, interoperable. I mean, not interoperable, but you can uh, clients as long as support both. It's fine. I think we just proceed with uh, DTLS 1.2 for now. And when DTLS 1.3 is available, we can, we can deal with it. Uh, Tobias Gondom, Huawei, non-working group chair head. Yes, big plus one. Go for DTLS 1.2. I'm, uh, I'm Robbie Hamilton. I'm with uh, Chemical Abstracts. Can't see, but it actually is a new member, so I have no idea for sure what mitigation means here. Um, and if there's, of the implementations that I've seen so far, is there anything specific in those as far as mitigation goes? Um, the reason I'm asking is we're a, a DDoS uh, attack target on a regular basis now. And uh, every IP address that tries to connect to us is different. And uh, so as far as I can tell, there could be 500 billion people trying to connect to us. So um, I don't, know necessarily even how to tell other than the fact that suddenly we're out of sockets on the server. So anyway, that's the question. Andrew and Roland, are you answering those question, that question? 
Uh, yeah, Andrew Mortensen, Harvard Networks. Uh, so mitigation is, we, we are attempting to define what mitigation means in the requirements draft. There's some terminology there, so uh, please take a look at that specific definition and see if it covers what you're talking about. Uh, I don't think the specific form of mitigation, whether you're using something that is a, you know, a firewall or uh, a DDoS mitigation device or just trying to put out uh, flow spec rules to block, uh, is, is within the scope of DOTS itself. Roland Evans, Rover Networks. Um, so if you look at uh, previous iterations of the use cases draft, there are some examples that do talk about some uh, mitigation technologies, but the purpose of, one of the purposes of DOTS is to be technology independent in terms of mitigation technology, so we're not locked into a given paradigm, right? Um, some of the, you heard earlier in the meeting, we we're talking about some of the additional proposed use cases will be coming, coming out, uh, and those feature different technologies and so forth to provide some, I guess, color commentary, right? If that helps. Hey, Victor, just a, a more color to the um, discussion. Um, as far as the way I see it, I think the s simplest way it, to paraphrase Andrew in the past has been, the, the, the idea of DOTS is to basically say, help it hurts here. And then as far as the mitigation goes, that could be anything. I mean, it could be unplug it. You know, it could be anything at the end could, could is in scope as far as what that could be, but that we don't want to prescribe that because people's ideas are different, you know, as people's definitions are different, and it's that's just a whole world of pain. So I think we're skirting around the, the questions of Barry Green Alchemy, um, because you're talking about you're in serious pain right now. So here's my suggestion, because the work that we're going on here in ITF is a new side. This is two years out. This is a lot of, we're trying to make ourselves better. But what you can do is, yeah, I'll point you to a, a little guide I give people, say, here's how you can bring your vendors in to figure out what is right for you. But you add one new question, all right, based off of this, from implementations. Every vendor you pull in to say, how can you help me? You say, what's your deployment plan and your roadmap for dots? All right, you start asking, what's your dots roadmap? And you pull all, like the vendors in here, pull them all in and says, what's your dots roadmap? Because you're in pain now, and so I'll, 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 offline I'll help you out in that part, but add the dots question. What do you got? Is it dots? And they'll look at you go like, what's dots? I said, don't, get a clue, get, get on board. With the future. <laughs> Thank you for the question, because this is an excellent example about how people read things into our documents or look for things. And we need to ensure that the architecture doc, which is where people go to first, oh, there's a DOTS architecture, clearly calls out how, you know, where mitigation fits into this. And that we, I, I believe we do. We may need to strengthen just a little bit more to clearly point out that um, this is how we signal for call for help. Mitigation is over there. So that, that so people coming to here saying, I'm in pain, will know that they have to go over there for that pain addressing for right now. That, that's all, I've been through many of these before where the documents do not clearly call out what's in scope, what's out of scope, and where else to look. Yeah, I would plus one that, that comment uh, that, that Bob just made. Fresh eyes on the document are wonderful, and if you don't feel like you see yourself reflected in the use case, please let us know because we want to update the text to do that. Okay, other topics to bring up to the mic. Okay, so uh, catching actions uh, from the discussion. So we agree that we're going to accept the, the signal draft uh, as a working group document. So if the authors can resubmit that as a working group document, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get that approved. Uh, I would also remind everyone we're still polling for adoption on the data channel uh, document since we started that before the, the working group. So again, if you have feelings either way, please do drop that on the mailing list. There's time. And then with the time we have remaining, not that it'll take that long, just wanted to review the proposed milestones. And I would reiterate what you're about to see here, uh, only Tobias and I have seen, and we'd like to discuss these with you. Uh, so we, are, of course, are behind on everything. We have the use case requirements and architecture documents as a straw man to say, working group last call after prod in September. 
what is the reaction of the working group to that and the, all the authors on those drafts? Hi, Andrew Martinson. Uh, speaking for myself and not necessarily for my co-authors, I think we, this is even conservative for the requirements in architecture. So you mean you could do earlier? Cool. Uh, what should we write there? Sorry for being so specific. Saturday. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so meaning two two weeks or something. Sorry, Andrew. Uh, not to be glib. Uh, I think probably by by uh, Prague. Okay. Noted. Fleming Andreas. <clears throat> I think you do need to stagger the requirements and the architecture document a little based on the discussion at use case as well, right? And use case and requirements, yeah, hopefully we can do that a little bit sooner. But you need a little bit of space for the architect to reflect whatever changes go in there. And also hopefully reflect any working group last call comments that come in. So if I internalize what you just said, use case requirements July-ish? So August, I'm, September architecture? So I'm only author on the architecture document. So, you know, I'm quite happy with September. I'm not as ambitious as my co-author, but uh, <laughs> I, I will let the authors of the use case and requirements documents speak for themselves. Daniel? Yeah, I think the use case should be addressed by two months. Okay. So what I'm hearing from the, the authors is July use case requ use case and requirements. I'm sorry, we're not editing this live. And then architecture documents staggered later for September. For the, from the rest of the working group, because Kathleen's not officially listening to any of this yet, because uh, we'll submit this. Uh, what's the reaction? I mean, any comments? Is everyone comfortable with that? Okay. And then, then it comes to the actual protocols. And so here we got to do a couple of things. So first, our official milestones actually say we're making a data model document and a transport document. Uh, the, my counter proposal to that is it looks like we're converging towards a data channel document and a signal channel document. So first, I would argue that we want to change the nature of the milestone itself and then tossing out a date of, uh, I'm sorry, of December on both of those. So does anyone have any feelings on first rebranding what the milestone itself is and then the timing of it? Um, hi, Nick Teague. Um, no, I'm for it. I think that, um, as Fleming mentioned before, as far as data model information model goes, they were probably more necessary when there was a, a number of candidates. I think now there's a degree of convergence and it can be just, those particular tasks can be just converged into that, that function. So, yeah. Other reactions from, from the working group on those? Okay. Well, Kathleen, we're going to submit these to you officially for your review so you can stare at them just as we described. Okay, so this actually brings us to the, the end of the agenda. We have time, so if anyone wants to come up to the mic, going once, going twice. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you very much, and we will send out the uh, invite for the upcoming virtual interim discussion in a few days. And uh, yeah, hereby closed. And if I could have the blue sheets, whoever has them, if you could run them up to the front. Who has not signed the blue sheets yet? And where are the blue sheets? Good.